program studying the Galactic Center using the then, new, the then newly commissioned uh, Keck-1 telescope with the speckle imaging addition to the near-infrared camera. Uh, with, the, with this instrument configuration, I think she set a sort of a record where in a, a night of observing, she got about 60 seconds of data. Uh, I believe that's about right. And uh, with, but, but the importance of the data were, were enormous. This was the beginning of her Galactic Center program. Uh, she's been a leader in the use of adaptive optics at the Keck uh, Observatory uh, from the very beginning and has continued to drive the Keck Observatory to maintain its world leadership in this area. Uh, her, her, uh, her awards for her accomplishments are far too numerous to, to recite, but I will just offer a few. She was elected to the National Academy in 2004 and was named a Caltech alumna, in, uh, a, a Caltech distinguished alumna in 2012. That same year, she shared the Crawford Prize with, for astronomy with Reinhard Genzel. Uh, this was repeated uh, last October when she was, uh, when she again shared with Reinhard Genzel the half of the Nobel Prize in physics for the discovery of a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. Um, amid all of this distinguished uh, prize winning members of the Caltech community, Andrea has a special distinction. For those of you who frequent the Heyman Lounge or used to frequent the Heyman Lounge, you know that there are pictures on the walls of Caltech's uh, Nobel laureates and Crawford laureates. Uh, with her accomplishment, her singular accomplishment of having received both, I expect to see two pictures of Andrea on the wall the next time I'm allowed to enter the Heyman Lounge. And with that, uh, it's great, it's my great pleasure to introduce Andrea Gaz to give this year's Neugebauer Lecture. Andrea. Thank you so much, Tom. I'm so thrilled to be um, uh, carrying out this lecture today. Host disabled participant screen share. Okay. This is my first hybrid <laughs> talk, so we're learning as we go here. Um, but let me just start with uh, the remarks. Actually, Nancy's going to help me here. Sorry, um, just one second. Well, this will stop yeah. others. Yes. yes. And I can share my screen. Yes. And we can go into PowerPoint. Okay, excellent. Hopefully everybody in the room and in Zoom space can see these slides. Oh. Okay, we're still learning. <laughs> I've gotten very good at Zoom talks, but not these hybrid, like in the room and. Okay, we'll try this again. The anticipation. <laughs> about it. That is not what we wanted. That's mm -hmm. worse. It looks good on Zoom. That's correct in Zoom. Okay. But you just need to move. I think you have two windows to wrap up screen. We just need to move it here. How do I um, swap displays? Sure. I'm going to go with uh, system preferences. It is mirroring it, yeah, that's so good. that's good. Um, so on PowerPoint slideshow, setup show, 
and just to browse them in the digital window. Yeah, the second one, perfect. And <laughs> well, it is imperfect, but maybe good enough. Oh, pardon me? Let's resume sharing the voice. So just see. stop sharing. I'll resume share. I'll resume share. Oh, look at that. Okay. Now just stop and reshare. <laughs> Sorry. Share screen. Yeah, It's good on Zoom. And this is what we're seeing here. Yeah. That won't work. I, I think the window just went on the other desktop. So if you can pull it to this desktop. I don't know how to do that, do you? Uh, Commando. Yeah. Uh, and uh... yeah, bring all different. I just pick this one. Yeah, they're good. Yeah, it's just blocking the bottom, but that's okay. I think we can we can minimize this. Perfect. Yeah, and then we're good. Good enough. Yeah. Um. All right, I'm tempted. Okay, I'm not going to fiddle anymore for danger of losing. This is good enough. All right, so how I had let's see how I had hoped to um, start this lecture was a little personal narrative, taking um, the cue from France Cordova's um, la the last Neugebauer lecture, where she told a little bit of her narrative of how she got to Caltech and um, um, how she came to um, work with Gary. Um, I just thought I would um, tell a brief narrative that starts very early, uh, which is about my parents. So my, my dad's a European Jew, highly educated, came from a pretty well um, uh, wealthy family, um, had to leave Europe during the world war and then went back. He married, oh, and he went back and he grew up in G Geneva. So big city boy, educated, he married a Catholic girl from a blue collar family. Um, and while they had lots of differences, which created a household full of loud disagreements, which I think prepared me well, um, they shared a, a tremendous love of the arts and huge commitment to education. In fact, in my mother's case, her family was so committed to her getting out of this very, very tiny town in Massachusetts that they sent her to high school in Providence, Rhode Island. And it just so happens, this is the same high school that Gary went to <laughs> for very random small world connections. Um, so I, I was very fortunate in the sense that I came from a family that very, um, valued um, education at a very high level and also introduced me to the concept that arguments aren't a problem and the different perspectives are actually quite useful. Um, I went to the University of Chicago lab schools, which is a very progressive school, came to MIT, thought I wanted to um, major in math, um, but uh, because I was super interested in um, concepts of space and time. And I really viewed that as a math problem, but quickly discovered that math was far more esoteric and physics was really the language that, that spoke to me. Um, I got involved in um, research as an undergraduate um, and got involved in high energy astrophysics studying stellar mass black holes. So from there, coming to Caltech, it seemed very obvious to join Tom Prince's group um, because he was studying stellar mass black holes. Uh, and he had this very exciting uh, balloon experiment that was gonna uh, use aperture masking, which seemed like a new neat new technology. But when I got here, um, Tom convinced me that there was a new exciting program that was just starting up. It was a program that was a collaboration of five faculty at Caltech and one grad student. It was a really interesting project. Um, but Tom convinced me that this, this um, program, which was to try speckle imaging 
um, at Palomar. So to introduce a new way of using Palomar Observatory to get to the diffraction limit. And in this original proposal, it, it offered the promise of studying black holes at the center of AGA. And I thought that, you know, that might be cool. Beyond that, it also, the, 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 the framework of this proposal was to use um, the N-cube, if you remember the N-cube, uh, Caltech's parallel processing machine. So again, I thought, neat new, neat new trick. Well, turns out optical speckle did not pan out quite as well as um, was promised. Um, and I had the interesting, um, challenge of trying to figure out whether or not to stick with the technology or to um, stick with um, what I thought what I, I was interested in, which was black holes. So to go back uh, with, with Tom Prince or all the other possibilities that were open at that very moment. But what I decided in the end to do, and I'm so grateful um, that, that, that this is um, how things turned out, was to join the infrared group um, to work with Gary Neugebauer, um, Keith Matthews and Tom Sofer. Um, the idea here was that infrared detectors um, were improving at a rapid rate and that using, uh, by going to the infrared, there was more scientific promise um, than was offered in the, in, the, uh, in the optical. I'm so glad I made this transition because I learned a tremendous amount from Gary. First, uh, is to speak your mind. One of the things I really appreciated about Gary is that he always told you exactly how he saw things. Very bluntly, if you were screwing up, he told you, and if you were doing well, he told you. Uh, but the first thing actually allowed you to believe the second thing. So um, Gary, um, Gary was very forthright. Gary also um, <laughs> um, gave me a very important lesson when I first joined the infrared group. One of the things that I was quite terrified at the beginning of grad school about was public speaking. In fact, so much so that I looked for graduate programs that wouldn't make me te teach, uh, that I could get an RA, a research assistantship, right off the bat. And that was one of the things that Caltech offered in addition to all the wonderful facilities, you know, an, an, an opportunity to get involved in research right away. Well, I gave my first research talk and I shook, I'm sure Keith can remember this, I shook from my head to my toes. It was awful. And Gary said, you have to teach. <laughs> and, so, and so I did. And I'm so grateful for that opportunity. Um, it, was an, it, was a, it was an interesting adventure in, in itself because I, for whatever reason, decided I wanted to, be a, to do the physics one discussion sections. And at that time, grad school students weren't allowed to. So we had to have a long discussion about why, uh, which for some reason, uh, I brought up the argument that there were no women on the faculty at the, that time. So I did win the argument. But for somebody who was afraid of, of speak, public speaking, this was an interesting <laughs> direction to take it. But it taught me a couple of things. One is that I really do enjoy teaching. Um, so I'm really grateful for that experience. And of course, as we all know, speaking and writing is such a critical part of our development as, of sci as scientists that this was an incredibly valuable uh, lesson that Gary gave to me. Now, there are two other lessons that I'm really grateful to Gary for. One is, is, is his advice about how to write a paper. He really believed that the most important section of your paper was the results section. As he put it, your discussion section is most likely to be gonna be wrong in five years. So make sure you get your science right. And that was such a valuable lesson of putting the results, the scientific truth, what, what you're able to say at, at a premium. And, and, and for that, I'm really grateful. Um, and then the second uh, piece of advice was about giving talks. So I hope I can follow his, his three words of wisdom about giving talks. One was don't show tables. Two, you can never underestimate the ignorance of your audience. And three, people like to hear what they know. So I can guarantee you, I, I have no tables. Uh, and we'll see that how the rest goes. So if you could just, I'm so sorry to introduce sure. this, the video turned off. If you could just go here. I got to find my little. This one.
that little arrow. Okay. Oh, it was on. Um, the little arrow. Could you just go to the screen? You know, I don't know how to, uh, since the air, the... the, the down Here, arrow. I'm going to let you do that. Oh, yes, okay. oh, there you go. One second. All good? Um, it seems that the camera is on, but it's not um, transferring. Try the other one. Can you see it now, Daria? Uh, still blank. Now we see. <laughs> but we cannot hear. Ilaria, can you hear now? Yes. Okay. Audio and video both? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I think, as I said before, when I was thinking about doing a PhD, it was clear that the technology wasn't ready for thinking about either AGN. And what I quickly learned when I joined the infrared um, group was that the idea of a black hole at the center of our galaxy was a tremendous opportunity if you move to the infrared. What prevented um, that project from being possible at the time was that the detectors were simply no, um, too noisy. So that was the limitation as opposed to the telescope diameter. So when I moved to UCLA, um, you know, all the while, I'm uh, keeping my eye on um, where, where things are, are developing. What I did do was study star formation. And while I thought that was a complete left-hand turn, that, that has actually come back to be of interest. But at the beginning of my faculty position at UCLA, um, it, it became possible to ask the question, is there a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy? And this is a program that started uh, very small. And I wanted just to right up front, um, uh, really give a lot of credit to my two long-term collaborators, um, Eric Becklin, who was Gary's second grad student. Well, and I was his second to last grad student. So there's symmetry, I was not the last. <laughs> um, and I do remember when I got the offer from UCLA calling Gary to ask him, should I take this offer? And he said, absolutely, you will love working with Eric. And I have to say, I'm so glad I took his advice because I have really enjoyed um, collaborating with Eric. Um, I think you can really tell the similarity in our training and in, in our value system of get the science right um, at all costs. That's the highest value system. And then um, the other collaborator is Mark Morris, who was actually a postdoc here for many years uh, before becoming a professor. Um, at UCLA. And then the other um, person in this um, picture is my very first graduate student, Beth Klein. So this is, uh, this is our group when, when, we, when we started, but I should also call out that Keith was very much um, involved in this as we were thinking about how to make this possible at Keck Observatory. The other thing that's worth pointing out at this, at this point is that while we thought going in, we had a great question, our very first proposal to the Keck time allocation committee was actually turned down 
it was turned down because people didn't believe in, in the technique that we were proposing. And they both said, even if you know it won't work, you won't be able to get to the diffraction limit. People were worried about the segmented nature of Keck. So this was the first program to really um, to, to demand the phasing of the segments on the, on the Keck Observatory. All right, um, but that did not um, deter us. And today we're a much larger collaboration um, the core collaboration is about um, 30 people, in uh, including Jessica Liu, who was a postdoc, who was originally a grad student with me and then became a postdoctoral fellow here at Caltech and is now faculty up at Berkeley, um, and Tuan Do, who is now a professor at UCLA. This, this has been a, um, a huge evolution, both in terms of the people, the technology, and the science that, that we are um, trying to uh, do. I should also note that this project started off as a proposal to do something for three years. So it was a very, so it was turned down for a much smaller vision than what this ultimately turned out um, to be. And I think that's really a testimony to um, technology enabled discovery. This is a project that has, in which new windows has, have been opened thanks to the advancements in technology. Now, to give you a sense or a big per picture perspective on what this project is all about, both in the beginning and where we are today, there's really two fundamental perspectives. One is a physics perspective. We want to understand whether or not supermassive black holes exist in the universe. Can we prove that these truly exotic objects exist? And then this gives us um, an opportunity to test how general relativity works around um, a supermassive black hole. The second perspective is more of an astronomical one, which is to understand what role that bl um, black holes play in the formation and evolution of galaxies. And even here, it's interesting to note the evolution that's go on, gone on over the last 20 years or so. When the first results, when we were presenting the first uh, phase of our um, uh, results in the late 90s, the framework for the relationship between the black hole mass and the supermassive black hole wasn't what we're showing here, which is that nice correlation between the mass of the bulge and the mass of the black hole. Um, but rather people at the time were asking which formed first, was it the black hole or the galaxy? And of course we had ideas uh, for how you would uh, produce either one or the other. And of course today we understand that that's the wrong framework. And that in fact, to get this relationship between the mass of black holes, and the mass of the central component, the bulge, one needs a, um, a feedback um, mechanism and also to assume that these things form synergistically. Whatever forms one, forms the other as a byproduct of their formation mechanism. And our galaxy gives us an unprecedented opportunity to look at that feedback or that relationship between the, um, the central black hole and the host, its host galaxy. All right, just to... Um, go back to thinking about um, where we were in the beginning, our, our thinking was we wanted to um, produce a very direct um, demonstration for the existence of a supermassive black hole. Black holes are objects whose full pull of gravity is so intense that nothing can escape, not even light. They're infinitesimally small. And fundamentally, they're objects where gravity has overcome all other known forces. So while they have no finite size, there is a size that we can associate with it, with it which is the Schwarzschild radius or the event horizon. And it's important for two reasons. One, if you can show that there's, um, if you can get a mass down to its Schwarzschild radius, it will become a black hole. And it really forms the proof of a black hole. We need to show that there's some amount of mass inside its Schwarzschild radius. That's the, that's the ultimate uh, proof. And that's what we're after is showing um, that the mass is inside a very small volume. The first evidence for, the, or the first suggestion of supermassive black holes, black holes that are much more massive than the kinds of black holes that got us thinking about black holes in the first place, those were the stellar mass, of black, stellar mass black holes, which are the outcome of the, of the evolution of very massive star evolution. The story is very different in the case of the supermassive, the ones that are a million to a billion times the mass of the sun, here, um, the observations led rather than the theory leading. And it was observations of AGN that, um, that suggested that perhaps at the center of these very energetic um, galaxies, 
um, there is a supermassive black hole driving this energetic phenomena. And in particular, as shown in this radio uh, picture, the jets that um, have tremendous energy, so it's easy to measure the energy in these jets. So something powerful has to be driving it. And then at the center, there's a mission, unlike anything emitted by stars um, or gas, which led people to suggest that maybe there's a supermassive black hole driving this energetic phenomena through the um, accretion onto a supermassive black hole. Nonetheless, that's a fairly indirect argument. So in our case, we are looking for, um, or actually I should say, that, act, that argument actually led people to suggest that perhaps all galaxies harbor supermassive black holes, even the, um, the quiet um, galaxies. And that was rough, roughly in the 70s that that argument was uh, first proposed. And of course, these are, with these would be uh, supermassive black holes that live at the center of the galaxy, um, where the densities are much higher uh, than uh, where they are around the solar neighborhood. And just to remind us of the, of the relative densities, the stellar density is about a factor of a billion times higher at the center of, a, of our galaxy than um, out in the um, stellar suburbs. So if we want to look for these um, quiet black holes or the, uh, the idea that maybe all galaxies harbor supermassive black holes, or quite frankly, to demonstrate that these things really exist in the, in the first place, our galaxy is a phenomenal place to look. It's the closest example of the center of a galaxy that we'll ever have to uh, look. The next closest galaxy is 100 times further away. Um, so that's certainly the pro or the advantage of looking at the center of our own galaxy. The con is that we live in our galaxy. So our galaxy is a flattened disk-like structure. So we have to look through a tremendous amount of gas and dust um, to see the center of the galaxy. This lovely picture taken from the, uh, from the Big Island shows the Milky Way very nicely. So all the, um, but you also see the impact of all the dust running through the um, center of uh, the plane of the Milky Way. If you think about optical photons, um, this extinction is um, at optical wavelengths is 30 magnitudes, or in other words, it means that only one out of every uh, 10 billion photons makes it from the center of the galaxy to us. In contrast, if you go to the infrared, um, one out of every 10 photons makes it to us at two microns, which is where most of this work has been done. So in fact, the infrared is in important, not only from the technical uh, perspective in terms of making the images, but also from the perspective of actually just seeing um, starlight at the center of the galaxy. Okay, so an oversimplified picture of what we're doing. We're looking at the uh, motions of stars at the center of the galaxy um, to derive um, the mass. Initially, thinking back to the three year uh, project that we were proposing, it was actually to measure velocity dispersion. So it was not actually individual orbits. The idea here being that um, looking at the velocity dispersion by measuring the proper motions of individual stars, which is a pretty um, unusual way of getting dispersions in astronomy. Typically we get them through looking at line widths. Um, we could use um, mass estimators by looking at the velocity dispersion. So um, this would allow us to look at how fast things were moving on average and to use their average distances to get the mass. Um, the much more um, precise and the much more, um, well, the, the one that's free of um, assumptions, the one that actually um, provides much stronger proof is to then measure the individual um, orbits. And that became clear um, after we started this program and successfully measured the proper motions that in fact, um, measuring individual orbits was in fact a reasonable uh, thing to do. But of course, it's, it's useful to keep in mind that people didn't even believe in the velocity dispersion. So orbits was a pretty um, distant um, hope at that time. Okay, so this, um, the need to get to the highest angular resolution tells you why you need to um, use Keck because you wanna confine the mass to a region that's as small as possible. So you want to get to the highest resolution possible. So that's, that's, the, that's the promise of, of Keck Observatory. Now, of course, as everybody knows, you, um, Keck um, does a, a beautiful job at getting, um, of observing things that are very faint, especially in the early days. But in the early days, it was much harder to get to the diffraction limit. And the problem was the, um, 
blurring effects introduced by the, uh, um, the Earth's atmosphere. This is actually some of the first observations that we took, and Keith can recognize this because there is the divot that was put in on purpose so that we could get Iris 7 and Sag A star in the same field of view. These are really short exposures. They're about a tenth of a second. If there were no atmosphere, the, um, these five bright stars would be the size of the small structures that are dancing around um, and would be um, rock solid. So it's the atmosphere that um, is making these um, speckle patterns. Um, okay, so um, there's a lot of solutions. One is to get above it. And of course, that's the solution of Hubble Space Telescope and James Webb Space Telescope. Um, uh, but in fact, what we've done here, especially with the early days of NERC, this is what I like to call Keith's baby, uh, the first near infrared uh, facility camera on CAC. And, and what we did, um, and this was in collaboration with both Keith and Alicia, was to um, build a re-imaging system that rescaled the plate scale because you needed the pixel scale to be smaller. And then we worked with um, a young engineer named Hilton Lewis <laughs> to change the, um, the uh, readout electronics so that you could um, take a picture that was, fat, um, that was quick enough. So it was a very software, um, it was hardware simple actually. So this was a fairly inexpensive um, and minor modification to the telescope to get going. And the work was in taking all thousands and thousands of frames with lots of overhead as Tom just referred to, I think in a half, we usually got a half a night and we would get 30 minutes, <laughs> 30 whole minutes. <laughs> But they were valuable photons. They were photons you couldn't get in, in any other way. Um, and so um, it's a reminder that metrics don't always tell you the full story. Um, this is what we did for the first 10 years. In fact, this is what both um, uh, the um, MPE group and um, our group uh, did with speckle imaging. So this was the way um, that uh, one overcome the distorting effects of the Earth's atmosphere. Of course, today we have adaptive optics, and adaptive optics was always in the vision for Keck, Keck Observatory, um, and it became a reality uh, roughly 10 years into this, um, this program. You can tell when we really believed in adaptive optics, because it was the year we stopped taking speckle data. There was a two-year, uh, two to three-year overlap before it was clear um, that um, one should abandon the technique of speckle imaging. Adaptive optics was so much more powerful than speckle imaging. And as I'll talk about towards the end, you, have, you pay a big price when you change your instruments in, the, in, this, in this game. Astrometry um, rewards you for consistency. Um, uh, when you change instruments, you pay, you, you, pay a, you pay a penalty function. But it was clear that adaptive optics was so much better for the first time, we could take a picture at um, more than one wavelength. We could take spectra um, and, and the field of view was so much, so much greater. And our ability to position stars um, of a given magnitude went up by about a factor of 10. So at this point, it was clear, given not only what we had already achieved from the motions of stars, that this experiment was gonna get a lot more interesting. Okay, this just gives you a sense this is actually a fairly um, early animation. You can see the five bright stars that we were looking at the speckle imaging pattern for, and it gives you a sense of scale going from the seeing limited observations to the diffraction limit. There's a small box that has a scale of an arc second, which is roughly the natural resolution um, at these wavelengths. And you can see that without these techniques, you see just basically a big blob in the middle. Um, and with these techniques, you actually see the stars that in some sense are the key, not in some sense, that are the key uh, to, to this experiment, because it's those stars motion that you're trying to, to measure. Um, in the next animation, I used to show animations of where these stars have gone um, at this scale, one arc second by one arc second, but things got too busy. <laughs> and so we're gonna look at an animation that is a fourth of the real estate. So one fourth. So this is just a ridiculously small area on the sky. This is a half an arc second by a half an arc second. I never get tired of looking at this movie. Because um, remember, people didn't think that we would see stars, never mind see them move. You didn't need, a comp you didn't need sophisticated um, computer an um, analysis in the early days to know that there were very fast moving stars 
that could allow you to measure the velocity dispersion. So to do the velocity dispersion, in fact, to do the orbits as well, you need to measure stars not just in this region, but over a much larger region as well. Um, for dispersions, you have to capture the whole cluster. And then for orbits, you need um, your astrometric reference frame, which if you told me that would become one of my favorite topics 25 years ago, I might not have done this project. Um, but you can probably see the most important star today um, in this, uh, in this uh, group of stars. Its name is SO2, it probably needs a better name. But in fact, we did give some thought to how to name these stars. The typical IAU convention for naming stars doesn't work because everything's moving. So um, we call that we name them S. Everything, everybody has an S in front. S for Sagittarius. Sagittarius is the A star is the emissive source associated with the thing we think is the black hole, and then indeed is the black hole. Um, the first number, which has a, a, a zero or a one, tells you how far away you are from the black hole in annuli. So zero just means you're within one arc second. And then the next number tells you that in at the moment of discovery for the group of discovery stars, just order them from closest to furthest at that moment. So that tells you that SO1 was not, sorry, SO1 at the time of discovery was the one we thought would be most interesting, but it was actually SO2 that won the race for, um, for, for a very obvious reason. SO2 was just at its furthest approach. Um, and it's apoapse, which is where stars spend most of, the, most of their time. The other things that are worth pointing out in this animation is that um, stars are trailed by a dashed line when you can see it with an image. Some stars just pop up, not because they're variable stars, although there are tons of variable stars in these fields, but because our technology is enabling us to see fainter stars. And then stars are um, trailed by a solid line once you um, have a spectrum of it and can get the radial velocity. And here you can see that there's been a huge evolution starting with, one of my favorite moments on the telescope working with Keith, which was trying to get um, a slit lined up <laughs> with, with NERC2 on SO2 behind the newly working AO system. That was one of the harder experiments, but successful, of course, because we were working with Keith. Um, and, in the, and then in the ensuing years, um, OSIRIS made the job much easier because then we didn't have to worry about getting things down a slit and keeping things you know, at a very small scale within the slit. So SO2 has had a, a long-term um, focus, but um, over time, and as the AO system um, gets more powerful, many, many other stars are becoming spectroscopically accessible. Okay, so with SO2, what did we learn? We learned um, that the, um, at the outset of this experiment, we knew there was 4 million times the mass of the sun inside about a parsec. And this was thanks to the work of Charlie Towns looking at um, uh, radial velocity uh, measurements of gas um, uh, near in, in this region. But the, re um, the mass was con confined to a region that was so much larger than the Schwarzschild radius that um, the suggestion that it might be bl a black hole is actually hidden well into the paper. It's not in the abstract, it's not in the title. And the reason is, is that there could be a, there's a whole host of other explanations for a concentration of mass um, at this density, including a cluster of any kind of dark object. Um, and then what people started to suggest, the idea of um, a fermion uh, ball, uh, which is like the equivalent of a neutron star, but rather than being co composed of neutrinos, they're composed of fermions. So there's been a lot of interesting thinking about what could cause a compact mass um, configuration at the center of the galaxy. What the orbits do for you, actually, the, 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 the velocity dispersion reduces the volume by a factor of a thousand. And then by the time you get to orbits, you've gone another factor of 10,000. 10, so cumulatively together, you've improved your understanding of the concentration of mass by a factor of 10 million. Okay, so at this point, all these other alternatives for the possibility of a supermassive black hole have been ruled out. And in fact, you've shown that the 4 million times the mass is confined to a region that can, uh, roughly corresponds to the size of the solar system. Okay. Um, so today, it would be, we would be hard pressed 
um, to go further than um, improving the, the, the evidence for a supermassive black hole beyond this improvement of a factor of 10 million. This really moved the idea of supermassive black holes from a possibility to a certainty. And, and surprisingly, you know, this has now become the best evidence today that for the existence of supermassive black holes. So while it was the AGNs that um, um, forced us to think about this possibility, in fact, the evidence is greatest at the center of our own galaxy. So today, I think the interest is no longer so much improving the existence of, of, of supermassive black hole, but rather um, to use this as a laboratory for understanding both the physics and astrophysics of supermassive black holes. Uh, that, yeah, this is, I, I didn't, since there was nothing in person, I had to show the, the Crawford Prize. And I wanted to put this in here just to remind me to really call out um, the, the real value of having two competing teams working on this for the last 25 years. Quite frankly, I wish I had kept a diary because it's been a fascinating 25 years. Uh, it's taught me a lot about science in all its, um, its, in all its glory. But at the end of the day, I think the science was tremendously benefited by having these two competing groups. There's nothing like competition for keeping you on your toes. There's not, nothing like competition for actually finding all, any mistake you might make um, and for thinking um, in, a, in, a more, in a deeper way than I think either one of us would have thought um, separately. So I'm really grateful um, to have um, worked, I guess, in parallel, of course, it's not always in parallel because we publish. So you can see how we learn from one another. Okay, so that's just my, my comment on competition. Um, moving now to, I'm gonna start with the astrophysics. One of the, one of the most um, rewarding aspects of this program has been um, not so much the ability to answer the question that we set out to answer, but the number of que uh, new questions that we didn't think to ask in the first place that have arisen from the data. So, so much of what um, we predicted to be around the supermassive black hole or the environment of a supermassive black hole has been inconsistent with the observations. I like to say, this is like, for me, this feels like being in a kid in a candy shop when things don't make sense. And I've come to learn, I've come to really appreciate that as a scientist, we enjoy that confusion. And I've come to understand that the outside world sometimes finds that surprising. But to me, as a scientist, um, when things don't work, and, and, and I apologize, this is um, uh, maybe, this was meant to be somewhat public-y. Okay, so the first prediction um, in terms of, um, what we predicted but did not see is that there should be a cusp um, around a, a stellar cusp around the supermassive black hole. In other words, there should be an excess of stars around the supermassive black hole. So it should be um, crowded with stars. The second prediction is that um, there should be no young stars. And in fact, young stars out at a parsec outside that big circle um, there were young stars that were known um, 20, 20 years ago. And that was part of why people were so skeptical about the possibility of the existence of a supermassive black hole because black holes should suppress star formation. Star formation starts with big balls of gas and dust that are very low density. And the tidal forces from the supermassive black hole should stretch or disrupt those um, fragile clouds. So rather than getting um, star formation, you would expect star, um, star formation suppression. And it's not a small problem. So if you think about the densities that are needed to overcome the tidal forces at the center of the galaxy, um, roughly at about um, an arc second or 0.04 parsecs away from the black hole, um, the gas densities that are required to overcome the tidal forces are a factor of 10 to the 11th higher than what's observed today. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a paradox that's many orders of magnitude um, uh, difference. Okay, so no young stars. And yet, so those were two key problems. So uh, if this were running ideally, there would be no um, pausing. So um, the animation here is in three dimensions. And um, in contrast with the um, other animation that I showed you earlier, um, the scale is different. So we're zooming out well beyond the edges of that two-dimensional animation. And we've color-coded um, the stars. 
So the young stars, which we um, predicted um, a lack of, are coated um, green, blue, aqua, green, blue. Um, so in fact, they dominate the population that we can see today. So this is um, what I like to call the paradox of youth. How do you get star formation in a region that is so inhospitable to star formation? And one of the, the delightful things about this project is it's really spurned a lot of thinking, a lot of diverse, diverse ideas have been proposed for how you get these young stars, these stars that are just a few million years old to reside um, within this region. One of the really important clues has actually come from continued observations. So you need to go longer to see the orbits at larger distances, just because their orbital periods are longer. But once you know the central piece, you can nail that down, the central potential. And you actually, all you need is velocities and then um, acceleration um, in the plane of the sky. Um, and then you can actually derive an orbit uh, for these stars at larger radii. And this animation is designed to pull back from um, the beginning um, to an angle, um, through an angle which should show that many of these young stars line up in a, in a, in a disk. In other words, there's a common angular momentum vector. Um, and it's very suggestive of the geometry of a solar system. So in fact, I think that much of the thinking today um, borrows um, from star formation. And this is where I'm really grateful for the star formation connection. Um, it was actually Doug Lynn who pointed out to me that in fact, <clears throat> the ratio of mass of the massive stars, the ma young massive stars to the mass of the black hole is the same as the mass of planets to the host, the host star. So in fact, in terms of a dynamical problem, um, a lot of the, the thinking that's been done for exoplanets can be um, applied to the center of the galaxy. The existence of this um, disk of stars suggests that perhaps um, a few million years ago, there was a very thick accretion disk um, that led to star formation and presumably um, uh, drove the, the black hole to be in a much more active state than we see today. And in fact, lots of people like Fiona are doing work that suggests that perhaps we can see um, uh, the signatures of, a, of the black hole at the center of our own galaxy being much more active in the past than, than we see it um, today. The second prediction that I, I mentioned was the old stars, the cusp. So when stars have been around for a long time through dynamical friction, you should form this cusp. And the old stars in this animation, these are the giants, are the um, orange stars. So there's actually a dearth of old stars. So where's the cusp? And that's, that's an interesting problem in itself. And then the third, and I'll, come, uh, I'll sort of circle back in a minute to those. The third problem that we didn't even think of to, or to make predictions are the magenta objects. And these are objects that are actually um, observed to be tidally interacting with the supermassive black holes. So these are objects that are in very eccentric orbits. And as they come in, they elongate. So they're the first spatially resolved um, uh, dynamical interactions around a supermassive black hole that have been observed. And one of the fascinating things is that they survive their closest approach, which suggests that there's a, there, there is a um, stellar-like object at, at, at the core. Today, um, and, and there's been a huge amount of uh, work um, uh, uh, associated with these um, mass losing objects. Um, originally, they were thought to be clouds, um, and which is what, what sh this animation is showing. So, uh, but the, the, the mass of a cloud is actually not that ma much. And these clouds, um, but if you model this as, a, as a, a binary star that merges, there's actually the potential to lose much more mass than the little cloud that was um, originally proposed. So the ability to drive accretion through these um, binary star mergers um, is enormous. The physical mechanism that today we believe drives this, this merger is the kozai lidov effect, the three-body interaction that shows is cropping up in all sorts of uh, fields. And the three-body system here is the central black hole and the, and the close binary. Okay, so today, um, this is um, an interesting process to think about. It's interesting um, because it pr possibly provides linkages with the LIGO um, experiment. With LIGO, you're seeing stellar mass black holes that are larger than you expect and are occurring more frequently. And this may be, from a very different vantage point, lighting up a, a process that may help us understand um, the, the LIGO systems. 
Today, we're, we've actually done quite a bit of work on, on binaries, and we are finding that the binary star fraction appears to be suppressed near the black hole compared to at further, further distances, but that, that's work that's still underway. Okay, let me end with a couple comments about the second um, aspect, which is our desire to test how gravity works near a supermassive black hole to probe um, the, the curvature of space-time. So these stars, are in a regime that give us the first opportunity to directly test um, how Einstein's theory of general relativity works in this environment. And in fact, it, with, with this, this work, there's two kinds of measurements one might expect to make. One is of um, looking at how the photons are affected by the curvature of space time, which is the relativistic redshift. And then the second test that becomes accessible is the precession of the periaps, which is how the object itself moves through space time. To do this, or to even have a seat at the table, you need to have a complete orbit of SO2, just to know its geometry in space. You need to know where the object is in order to do these tests. This is a, um, so SO2, as I said, is the most important star. It has an orbit of 16 years. So once you do that, the next time it goes through closest approach becomes your entry into this game. That happened in 2018. For, so for many years, we were 2018 or bust. Um, and anybody who measures binary star systems or planets will tell you it's the turning points that are essential. There were three turning points in the space of six months. Um, uh, and that was a super exciting moment. Um, this animation just gives you a little bit of a sense of what we're looking for. This is over a very long time pe period. So this is um, the radial velocity from the Newtonian piece. And this is the relativistic component that spikes um, at closest approach. You're sensitive, the most important um, observations are made within six months, but there's um, a three year period where you can actually see, see the impact. In other words, where you can't ignore this effect. That's another way of thinking about it. Um, the, the total impact is 200 kilometers per second. You might think, oh, well, that's easy. I mean, our measurements are made with much more precision than that. Today, we can, we can measure this to about 10 kilometers per second. But the, the dominant source of uncertainty is actually the shape of the orbit. It's the thing that you're measuring um, it with respect to. So when, in looking at the plots um, that we present, it's useful to keep that in mind, that it's not the individual uh, measurements, but you're under, at that moment, but it's the shape of the, the orbit that's key. So far, everything is well-behaved. Um, if you measure, um, if you model this as just a single parameter, um, uh, model saying that zero is Newton and one is um, Einstein, um, then um, in fact, our measurements are completely consistent. This will become much better as the orbit improves over time. Now, um, I wanna focus now just for a second before I end on the next piece, which is the precession of the periaps. So the precession of the periaps, which is you're seeing um, modeled in, ex in an exaggerated form, um, says that, um, that gravity alone should make this orbit move in a prograde sense. In other words, you don't get back to the same place, but you move in, a, in, a, in, a, in the direction of the orbit, you should overshoot. Okay, so what's happening? And, and this signal should start, when it, we've anticipated, should start to merge post 2018. So we're really in the middle of this. And it will just get stronger as we head towards apoapse, which is in 2026. Okay, so the this I would never publish this, but I just wanted to share where, where we are and what I'm most excited about. Um, and, and, it, and I think, it, and keeping Gary's wisdom um, close to, to heart, I think is really um, essential for, the, for where we are today. Our preliminary observations don't support prograde precession, but rather if you just take everything at face value, you plug everything in and analyze it the way we always do, the orbit appears to be opening up in the opposite direction at twice the speed. So in a retrograde motion. Okay, so that's puzzling, um, but, and, and if, but, and I wouldn't encourage you to take this too seriously because I'll tell you, and, I, and I'll explain why, but if you wanted to take this seriously from a physics perspective, what gives you um, retrograde motion is an extended mass distribution, right? And in fact, if you just model the mass, um, there's about just under 20,000 solar masses of matter inside 
SO2's furthest approach, which is 0.01 parsecs. Then you can ask yourself, well, is this even a reasonable number? And then it get, this is where it kind of gets interesting. So if you think about um, the velocity dispersion measurements at, at a parsec, there you start to see an extended mass component. So there is, I mean, we know there's, there's, there's stuff there. At some point it, do, it dominates. And if you assume a traditional cusp profile that's pegged at a parsec, this is the mass that you anticipate. This took me a while. I mean, I, I, it sort of finally dawned on me. Oh, just calculate what you expect. It's not that far off. So that's also an important um, reminder to us that in our efforts to see per grade precession from GR, never forget that there may be a significant, a significant extended mass component, both in the form of baryonic matter and potentially in the form of non-baryonic matter. Now, I'm also gonna tell you why you shouldn't believe this yet or why I don't believe this yet. Because you have, as these measurements, like each one of these observations, as we go from velocity dispersions to measuring accelerations, to orbits, to redshift, to um, precession, each one makes a higher demand of your analysis that you've put your 25 years of data together in a way that there isn't an accumulation of small error. And it turns out that my biggest nightmare or what keeps me up at night is the astrometric reference frame. Everything in this field moves and almost everything is in the potential of the black hole. So that means that while we have already dealt with and everybody in this field deals with the proper motion, the velocity, you're at the point, and, and we anticipated this, at this point where you should be thinking about accelerations. The impact of acceleration on your reference stars grows as time squared. So in other words, in the beginning, you can totally ignore this happily, but you, today, you should not. Effectively, what everyone's doing today is assuming that there's no acceleration, but the acceleration is negative. I mean, it's negative. There's no positive accelerations in a central potential. So you're constructing a reference frame that is accelerating outwards. Today, we deal this by this by, by iteratively throwing out anything that looks like it's accelerating, which means we, we're doing this odd thing of clearing out the reference frame from the inside out. In other words, exactly where you want, them, you want your reference stars. But that kind of, kind of deals with it. But nonetheless, you have some measurement uncertainty. So if you just simulate, well, I have this much uncertainty and I'm going to allow that much acceleration. This is on order. In other words, this, this can, uh, the other way to interpret this is the difference between the acceleration above the um, Newtonian case from closest approach to furthest approach, that's 20 micro arc seconds per year squared. That's what you're looking for. And it turns out that at our level of measuring the reference stars and not putting in the acceleration gives you a systematic error of about 20 micro arc seconds per year squared. So it's taken us a while to figure out. That's why we're not here, but I just wanted to, I, I, wanted to share why you should, um, a lens through which one should interpret um, precession measurements, because we have to handle the acceleration term before any believable um, precession measurement um, is made. Okay, I'm just gonna end, uh, I'm not gonna go through this. This is obvious to everyone here. More telescopes, AO is better. We need better AO for TMT. TMT is gonna be amazing. We're only seeing the tip of the iceberg, I guess I'm saying it, and I'm really excited about um, the future of um, this program. So in the spirit of Gary, tell them, you know, tell your audience what you said. I hope if nothing else, I've convinced you that it has been an interesting 25 year journey um, in answering this question of, is there a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy? And I think we've um, provided more questions than answers, which was really the fun of research. Um, and I'm really grateful for everything that I learned um, from Gary. Thanks for your, for your attention. So, um... I have to say, I will, I will just start by telling you that uh, the first time that you came, I was sitting at the Keck 
observing room. Uh, during observing, and you were coming up, and you came in and showed me the data, the, your early data. It was the first time I was convinced there really was a chance of there being a supermassive black hole. So it was, you, I, I, I like to say, I, I'm at least faster than the Nobel Prize committee <laughs> in figuring out what's good. Um, with that, uh, let's see, I don't see, do, I, do we get to see the, any questions? No, no hands. Okay. Fiona, Fiona has a question. So I could Yeah. That's uh, that's my favorite interpretation. So in fact, if you look at the luminosity of um, G2, it looks like um, a th the luminosity, you can model it really well as a 30 solar, um, 30 solar luminosity black body. And so the interpretation, um, oh yeah. So the question is about G2, it, are, we, um, is it, are we convinced that the interpretation of G2, which is the tidally disrupting, was the prototype for the tidally disrupting objects at the galactic center. Um, and there are two kinds of observations that are made for these objects. One is spectroscopically, and one is um, of a, a, it's a uh, bracket gamma emission line. And I just want to say that's the hardest spectroscopic measurement that's ever been reported. It's because it's an emission, it's faint, and there's a ton of gas. So to get that right is, is non-trivial. Okay. Um, but uh, in contrast, the L prime, you also see it at L prime. It's, it's really bright at, um, it's, it's, it's invisible at two microns. So our standard astrometry, you don't see it. But if you go to three microns L band, or if you go to, God forbid, M band, which we did, <laughs> it's really bright. It's, it's one of the easier observations you make at those wavelengths. So there's, there's an interesting contrast. And it's the long, it's those imaging observations um, that suggests that you can model it ni very nicely as a black body. And so the way I think about this object as, um, as an object that is um, inside, is you're seeing the, the dust photosphere, uh, you know, optically thick thermal sphere. And if you look at the, um, the models for mergers, that's roughly the luminosity that you would expect for two, two, two solar mass objects merging. And then the interpretation of the, um, the emission is that you're seeing optically thin gas that's illuminated externally um, to, to light up the tidal tails that are much thinner. Um, if, and now Smadar knows, um, who has done tons of quasi lit off calculations in all contexts. Um, if you look at, um, the if you if you just start with a population of all binaries at the galactic center and ask how many will merge at different time scales um, for the young for the um, for main sequence stars you expect twenty percent of the population of the binary population to have mer merged um, so that's why I'm also very intrigued that close in so inside that disk the the stellar disk like inside an arc second is where we're seeing this um, lack of um, binaries. I mean, binaries are, are, are um, they're fun. I mean, I love studying them. <laughs> um, but our, and our data set lends itself very naturally to, to a couple of different um, kinds. So we, we repeat the central piece a lot to, to keep track of the radial velocity of these guys. So you can just fold them on many, many time, um, different time scales. Um, and it looks like the highest fraction of binaries that can exist for these massive stars is 40%. And massive, for, the, for our null result, I mean, not a single star shows up in, as an RV variable in this region. Okay, um, so our cadence is what allows um, for a leakage of 40%, assuming that you know what the binary star distribution looks like. So we just took what um, massive stars um, the populations in the solar neighborhood. You can also look for binaries through eclipses and astrometric um, wobble. So that gives you broader um, radial coverage. Of course, we've taken a lot of images um, and you find eclipsing binaries 
Um, and they're, I mean, they're beautiful. I mean, we found some pretty crazy ones like ellipsoidal binaries where tidal distortion uh, must be happening. So it looks like the um, eclipsing binary star fraction is consistent with what the population. So again, big, you know, big caveat because the eclipsing, you're not, you know, you're only seeing a small fraction, but you are seeing them. And then at the rate that's consistent with what you would expect, whereas the RVs, which are, um, we only have data sets that suitable in the middle. So if we could get, you know, we're gonna keep trying and expanding this. The last technique and, um, is astrometric wobble. Anybody who does astrometry knows this is a really hard game. And um, our, we, for a while, we're really excited that we might be seeing astrometric wobble, um, but that's where you have to be super careful because any instrument changes that happen can be misinterpreted as um, shifts. So again, we, we're really careful. I mean, this is something that we worked very carefully um, with Keith. You just take the observations in the exact same way every time. So while you might not know your distortion solution perfectly, the fact that you do it the exact same way every time, as long as nothing else changes, helps you a lot. But we do have three major phases. You have the speckle phase, which in a sense you can throw, I mean, it's, it's so much less precise that it, it's not, not that important. You have the first phase of, of NERC2, but there was a dichroic in the AO system that was installed upside down. And so Keck flipped it which is the right thing to do. And you wouldn't want Keck not to flip it, but it means that it, 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 it creates the need for a new distortion solution. And you just don't, it, it's a discontinuity. So in any way, you can discover things that look like they have a period of roughly 10 years, but that's the duration of sort of the, ex, ex, um, or eight years. And that's the duration of speckle, the first AO setup and the second AO setup. So you should be very, careful um, with, with those. So that's the state of the astrometry binaries. Okay, but yeah, I, I, think, it's, I think it's plausible. I'm I super excited. What? I didn't believe it's Okay. <laughs> well, we, we have some papers that sort of put, put out our ideas about G2 as a binary. Um, Let's see, Mansi, you said you had a question. Yeah, so there's something about the Zoom test you did by me. Oh, okay. great. I was also struck by the G2 observation. And then, so I did nine, you had a few other photos. Oh, yeah. So now we found a, um, uh, many other members of this class. So it, it was, uh, we published this in Nature in 2019. Um, and here you have to be careful because what are the, you know, what are the signatures of what we call the G objects? I mean, lousy terminology <laughs> spectral types but g was for gas that's how they were originally named um so you're looking for red uh emission line objects and i'm looking at tom and keith because there's been a long history of red emission line objects at the galactic center <laughs> Some that, Gary, uh, that um, Eric Becklin discovered with um, Gary. Those were the Wolf Rayet stars. This is another population that's not as luminous. So they have this. The, they have the same properties, and many of them are elongated um, in in the same way. Um, so G, let's see, G one <laughs> was one that we caught just after closest approach. Um, so you see it as comp, um, extended, and then it becomes compact. So these objects are really fun because they dynamically evolve in concert with their orbital motion. So they have differences in, in the distribution of how much they get dilated as well. In the well, that's an, um, you know, yeah. So today we have about a half a dozen of, of these objects that are recognized. Um, and the ones that are most believable are the ones that um, come in closest. And they are really interesting because they're incredibly eccentric. Uh, like 0.98, they're not subtly eccentric, they're really eccentric. And it, and it may be that we're biased to seeing the ones that are eccentric because they're ones that start off normal and then you know get stretched out and elongated. So they kind of catch your, your attention. Be, uh, yeah, so we're still, we're, still, we're still trying to put together uh, a, a reasonable sample. Um, of these objects. Well, I just, I'll leave it at that.
Anna Churlow, who's a postdoc at UCLA, has been leading that. There's a question from Charles Bryson. Um, what do you see as the role of JWST in the study of uh, the lab experiences? Well, JWST is really helpful um, at the largest um, uh, distances. So one of the things that's challenging with adaptive optics is your field of view. So you get these exquisite images, but they have tiny fields of view. So um, there's our so what what we've actually got two programs now um, that have been approved for the the first round with JWC and what we did is we tried to calculate where the confusion of impact the cute confusion effect for Keck with you know the ten meter versus JWST and then to focus on the um, at, at larger radii so to use the complementarity bet between between um, James Webb and um, the ground and of course you can you can do Phenomenal things at the long at the longer wavelengths that you just can't do with ground. Fact, oh yeah, very much so. So that's one of the the you just clean up spectroscopically, and since there's so many um, interesting questions associated with the spectra, that's a that's a that's a great that's a great um, place for for us to focus on. Yeah. Any maybe we should uh, end this sure. uh, and. Uh, Thank you again for a, a wonderful talk and an absolutely spectacular um, uh, contribution. Uh, Thanks for the opportunity and all the training. <laughs> <laughs>